Hey everyone, thanks for coming. I'm going to make a presentation on a thing called the uh, ultra high throughput. The name is going to change. So the, the, the reason it's called ultra high throughput is a really bad, uh, it's a really bad joke because it spells UHT, which is a type of milk, uh, it's <laughs> long shelf milk. Uh, but the, the main reason I think it's going to change is that the purpose of what I'm going to describe, it's not just about throughput. And in fact, um, it's primarily about interoperability more than uh, more than throughput, uh, but it, you know the name's stuck, and so for now it's going to be ultra high throughput, and we'll have to think about how to call that. But it's the next era of rollups, so let's uh, let's dive what it is, and I I, I think of it as uh, you know it's a roadmap for, uh, for 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 Tezos, but an exciting evolution of the of the protocol, and also part of the motivation for doing all these rollups. So Tezos is on a roll. Um, we have caught up technologically. Uh, I love everyone who says that Tezos is the best protocol technologically, but you know, for a while that wasn't uh, that, for a while that was true, and then for a while that wasn't true, and now it's true again. So um, that's great. I think you know, if if you're not a um, if, if if you're not a market leader, um, if you're not an incumbent, um, you can't really afford to just be like slightly good. You have to be much better than the incumbents. Uh, and we were for a while, you know, um, this was pioneer proof of stake in 2018, uh, and now I would say we're um, uh, in a handful of protocols who can actually. Um, uh, who can actually scale the uh, the work on the um, smart rollups and the ability to have enshrined rollups on Tezos um, is really strong, and that's something we have now. Uh, and by the way, you know, with all this work on layer two, it doesn't mean that layer one was forgotten either. Um, throughput has gone on massively on layer one. Um, latency has gone down, so there's been a lot of uh, improvement work on layer one continuously. But what we have on layer two is truly special. Consistent upgrades. Um, smart rollups activated with Mumbai, uh, and of course, you know, there's um, there's two parts really to this um, rollup uh, roadmap. One is uh, the smart rollups themselves. The other one is a data availability layer. Uh, now, data availability is a weird concept. It took me a while to grasp it, and I and I realized only a few weeks ago that uh, data availability is um, is not a good word for it. Uh, the word someone else uses, which I think is better is a proof of publication. So, you know, if, if you're in a, a, a validator in a blockchain, typically you do three things. You order transaction, you, you prove to everyone that the transactions were published. You say like, look, here's a transaction. It's been published, you know, it's, it's there on a blockchain. Um, and then you execute them. So with rollups, what, we've, what we're doing is we outsource execution. The validators do not have to execute every single rollup that's on the chain. They are executed by separate rollup nodes. But data availability is still on the Tezos chain, and if we want to scale to very large um, number of transactions without using things like committees and, with, uh, and, and while being as decentralized as possible, then you want to add data availability layer, which is essentially um, taking all the data that's posted on a blockchain and sharding it, spreading it across the bakers and across the nodes, as opposed to having everyone download everything. So what is the end game of rollups? And one vision that people might imagine of rollups is app chains, app chains everywhere. Uh, you know, you have an, an idea for an app, you make a rollup for it, uh, and every single, uh, every single app is its own rollup, is its own chain. Um, it's trendy, but I, I don't think app chains are really what we want, because if you have an app chain for everything, I mean, sure, rollups can talk to each other, um, they can talk to each other very securely, because of the bridges that um, that exist to the to the chain, they don't rely on trusted multisig. There are um, cryptographic proofs which are available here, but uh, it's still cumbersome. You don't have this very easy uh, atomic composability of applications if every application lives on its own chain. Now, for some chain, for some application, it makes sense. There's a lot of applications who are very self-contained. You know, if you're building, let's say, a large game and your community primarily interacts with this game and the game interacts only weekly, uh, sorry, um, not every week, but weekly uh, with the rest of the, uh, uh, with the rest of applications, and you know, app chain might make a lot of sense. But for a lot of applications, they don't, don't really do that. So if we, don't, if we don't really want app chains, why are we building rollups? You know, what's, what's the point of, uh, of the rollups? And so let's look a little bit at what uh, fundamentally people want when they're building on a blockchain. Uh, they want performance. That's important, you know, you, you, you don't want, and, and when they say they want performance, really what they want is they want low fees, right? They want to be able to have lots of transactions, but they don't want them to be very expensive, and for that, you need to have this performance. 
Composability. Now, that's the part that's um, that can be very important, specifically if you're building defined type of application. Then composability is extremely important. Um, you want your assets to be able to go from one protocol to another. Um, it's a meme of money Legos, for example, that people had a few years ago. If you have uh, a DAO that collects NFTs in an NFT marketplace, you want them to be able to talk to each other directly and in a simple fashion. Decentralization. I mean, again, people don't want decentralization, but what they want is they don't want the chain to just implode uh, uh, under their feet. Uh, and for that, you do need decentralization. You know, if, uh, if your chain is reliant on a multi-signature uh, to be secured, it works until it doesn't. Um, so they want the, uh, the, the, the stability that comes from decentralization, not decentralization per se. Now, maybe they don't know that they want that. I think to a large extent, people don't really realize why they need decentralization or why they want decentralization, but it comes progressively. And then we saw it, for example, with, um, with DeFi. So um, in 2021, there were a lot of, um, and 2022, lots of DeFi protocols, and then lots of centralized type of uh, lending. And we saw in the credit crisis that uh, happened in, uh, um, in the crypto space that, well, the centralized lenders, they actually went and did a bunch of um, silly unsecured loans or run away with the funds and all of these collapsed, whereas the uh, DeFi who were actually decentralized uh, and, and, and working correctly, lending protocol actually did very well. So people learn, people learn over time why decentralization matters. Um, you know, we saw, for example, with Axie Infinity, the, the Web3 game, uh, it was a fork of Ethereum with a multi-sig bridge to Ethereum. They were hacked for 800 million because of their multi-sig bridge. Uh, I don't think people have completely realize the danger that comes from there. But, um, you know, it, 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 um, it happens over, uh, over time. We saw another uh, bridge recently, the, the multi-chain bridge um, that was uh, running with, uh, with scotch tape on someone's computer. So, you know, people don't care about decentralization until they have to, but over time, they, 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 you know, they, 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 they understand. Interoperability, I think, is quite important. Uh, and by that specifically, I mean the ability to use really different systems, different languages. Um, it's the ability for people to use what they're used to or what they're already using that works for them and being able to deploy that. Uh, and then good developer experience, which I think goes, uh, goes hand in hand with, uh, uh, with that. So how do we... Uh, that well, so L2 does not necessarily mean fragmentation, and that's what I said. You don't just because you're building on a layer two doesn't mean you have to have layer two everywhere. In fact, when people think of L2, they think of scaling horizontally. They think of well, the way we're going to get scalability, right, is because we're going to have you know a thousand rollups in parallel, and every rollup is going to process some transactions, and because the set of people validating the rollups does not need to overlap, then you know, like one person will validate one rollup, another person will validate another rollup, and that's how you scale. Not everyone has to validate everything. Um, and that's a great way of scaling, but again, you know, not great for um, composability, not great for fragmentation. What's less known, but true, is that layer two is actually a great way of scaling vertically. So, even if you want to, buy, to build a huge monolithic ledger with composability, just like one big state where all of your smart contracts are going to live and talk to each other, you might say, well, if I'm going to do that, I don't, you know, like that's, you know, that's not scaling horizontally. I'm not, I don't have all these independent ledgers. Um, I don't need a, a layer two. And my answer to that um, is that you, you actually do, because if you try to build this at, uh, the L1 level, if you say, oh, my chain, you know, we're going to have a one big state and everyone's going to validate it. That's the uh, Solana approach, for example. Then you're demanding that every single validator to the network has to still validate everything. And that doesn't scale very well. And also it hurts decentralization. You're saying that every person who validates this ledger, they need to be able to do all the compute. Whereas if you move to a layers, uh, a rollup system, you just need a rollup node to do that. And the difference is that the trust assumptions are very different. On a layer one network, you have an honest majority assumption for the liveness um, and safety of the chain. Like you need 67% or 51% or your validators to be honest and to not collude with, uh, you know, with each other to attack the chain. That's really hard. It, it's the weakest, you know, uh, from a security perspective, it's one of the weakest links of, of, of blockchain, it's like this is decentralization, that's why it's so hard to preserve. You need everyone to just really be 
as diversified as possible. And that's why it's important to, um, to kind of keep low requirements for people being able to participate in that because you want all this decentralization. It's also why you don't want to overload uh, the validators with, uh, with too much power or you don't want to use decentralization as a security crutch. You want decentralization for as little as possible and ideally that's just censorship resistance and consensus. But with a rollup, uh, if you use a ZK rollup, for example, or a validity rollup, your trust assumption is nothing. It's just basically like you know, either someone comes up with a proof or no one comes up with a proof, but you know, we don't have to trust anyone. With an optimistic rollup, it's also very good. With an optimistic rollup, your assumption is there's one honest party. Like all you need is a single honest person. Someone in the world is paying attention to the rollup and is honest. And, that, and that's all you need. That's your security assumption. Now, I much, much prefer a one out of n security assumption than a 50% security assumption. Much easier to do. And so if you're saying, well, we're going to ask for a huge computer with lots of RAMs and lots of CPUs to validate the chain, and everyone is going to have it, that's going to hurt your decentralization. It's not good. However, if you say, well, I need one honest person in the world to be able to have this computer to validate the chain. That's an assumption I'm very happy to live with. That's a very, that's a very easy one. So if what you want is a huge monolithic ledger, you know, like very, very composable, you're still much better off with an L2. It solves so many problems. You don't have to worry about your mempool, for example, because the L1 becomes your mempool. So there's a lot of technical solutions which are um, which should solve this way. There's one chain that has pursued this approach, by the way. Um, it's a flow blockchain. They do a lot of other things not right, but the one thing that they got right is this. Essentially, they separated the consensus from an execution um, with, a, uh, with an L2. So don't think of L2 as just fragmentation. Think of L2 as the proper way of actually scaling a monolithic ledger. All right, so we're here on the L1 with thousands of, uh, uh, of transactions per second now on, uh, uh, on L1. And so, you know, it does all the thing. Um, it does the execution of transaction. Um, it uh, stores value, it does the staking, the consensus, and it stores the data that you need for the transaction. Um, and you know, what, what, what would we like out of this? Well, uh, we want some uh, better performance, uh, essentially latency and throughput. Um, latency is how long you have to wait for your transaction to come in, and throughput is how many transactions you can push per second. Uh, you want more interop, but you would like to stay decentralized and you would like to stay composable. So we're moving here. Uh, with Mumbai to millions of transactions per second. And currently the way this works is like you still have this layer one, which does all this layer one thing, but now you have a little constellation of, uh, oh yeah, uh, you have a constellation of smart rollups around it who can actually offload some of the execution for any application that might require a lot of, uh, uh, of throughput. But they're still relying on L1 for consensus and also for data availability. Uh, and also for cross rollup communication, which means, you know, data availability means if you want to publish transactions for these rollups, they should probably be public, you know, they need to be published on the, on the layer one. So you don't have this computational bottleneck, but you might still have a data bottleneck here. With uh, data availability committee and data availability layers, that's how we scale the data. So in order to not put all of the data on the, uh, on the L1, we can use data availability committees. A data availability committee typically is going to be, it could be a small group, like you know, maybe you'll have uh, eight or 12 signing nodes who say, look, we'll, we'll store your data. You don't have to store it on the chain. We'll store your data. You might say, well, if you're just going to depend on like eight or 12 people, you know, I, you know is, is that just like a multi-sig? Are they going to just be, you know, running the chain. And no, the, the, the trust assumption that you can have with um, that AVD committee can be fairly small because again, you can require a, uh, you can have a uh, one, you know, like you can have a one honest out of every one assumption uh, and rely on that. So you, you can still have pretty good trust assumption in doing so, uh, but it's not convenient. You need to go out and you need to find this committee and you need to set it up. So for less friction and more decentralization, uh, We've been building a, uh, a data availability layer as part of the uh, as part of the chain. Um, the idea essentially is that instead of asking uh, bakers to download all the data of every block, every baker is assigned a little bit of the data that they have to uh, to download, and they download that piece of data. And then there's cryptographic magic in the form of uh, CATE commitments and error correcting codes. That means that even if some uh, are dishonest and don't download the data or claim that they do and don't really do it, we can still recover all of the data. 
So that approach, um, you know, it's uh, it, we, we've seen it in a few other uh, blockchain. It's present in uh, uh, it's present, for example, in Polkadot. There's a version of that in Celestia. That's what uh, Ethereum has been calling uh, dank sharding, for example. So that's the data availability layer. And once you have the data availability layer and smart rollups, you really truly have. Uh, Millions of transactions on a, uh, on a chain without any uh, without any committee, just basically the just basically the chain. Now, how does uh, interop works with this? Well, we can have interop by having different smart rollups cater to uh, different communities. So, for example, we can have a Mikkelsen smart rollup which runs. Mikkelsen as a VM, and we can run traditional um, to the smart contract directly. It can have the same API. As the um, as a Tezos chain, so it can run RPCs that will be indexed by Tezos wallets. Sorry, indexed by Tezos indexers, consumed by Tezos wallets, and we can have an EVM smart rollup. So yesterday it was announced uh, uh, Isulink, which is an EVM uh, rollup running on uh, on a Tezos chain, which is compatible with you know not just EVM smart contracts, but the rest of the Ethereum ecosystem, meaning uh, MetaMask, for example, and other libraries. So. Again, uh, this EVM smart rollup has its own RPCs, and those RPCs can talk to these different services. So that's one way to get uh, interop. If you are an app and you've been running on, Eth on Ethereum, and if you know the gas fees are too high, uh, and it's not a good, and you know it's not a good uh, place for your app, then you can deploy it on the EVM smart rollup. So that's one way to uh, have interop. And of course, because all of these rollups are bridged to um, the layer one. You can move assets, for example, from your EVM smart rollups to your Mikkelsen smart rollups, and vice versa. So maybe if there's a popular DeFi app on the EVM smart rollup and you have some assets in this Mikkelsen smart rollup, you can move them here, trade them, put them back here. So, and you can also have rollups in any uh, any language you might imagine. Uh, it's anything you can build out of the um, uh, rollup SDK. You can uh, you can run. All right. So this is 2.2. Other tentative name for UHD. Not a fan of it, but maybe it works. I don't know. It's been overdone, but you know maybe it's been overdone because you know don't don't argue with success as a uh, as a technique. Um, so where do we want to go? For so what we would like to do is something that looks a little more like this. So we still have smart rollups which might be app chains or which might be specific, but the idea is to have one big rollup. Um, Called the UHT rollup, uh, and that UHT basically uh, should be the kitchen sink, right? So it should be able to run EVM because it's clearly demand for people uh, who have this um, EVM application. So the application, uh, or they want to check a box, they want to run that. So clearly the UHT has to be able to run that. Um, it has to be able to run Mikkelsen contracts because we have an entire ecosystem, of course, of uh, um, Tezos developer, and also it's a better VM. So we want to have support for that. But really beyond that, we would like to have support for a lot of other um, languages. We'd like to be people to be able to write smart contracts in Rust, in Go, in C++, in all sorts of uh, programming languages. Now, this rollup can then have RPCs that makes it compatible with Tezos Wallet and Tezos indexers, but also with indexers and wallets of other um, ecosystem. What are the properties do we want? We want to have low latency, of course, inter interoperability, but more importantly, now we're adding composability, meaning all the smart contracts which are deployed inside these rollups can just directly talk to each other. They don't have to go back to layer one, or they don't have to bridge across to other rollups in order to, uh, to do that. So how does this work? Well, it's a multi-environment platform, right? We have EVM contracts, you have Mikkelsen contracts. Um, it also means a lighter L1. So because a lot of uh, execution moves to these rollups, the L1 can stay decentralized and move to something like a five second block time. Uh, I'd like to mention also that the, the block time and the latency you see on a, on a blockchain is really, um, it's not a technical decision, it's, um, it's also a political decision. Because in some sense, if you really reduce the latency, you are putting constraint on where the nodes can be hosted. You know, uh, important question is, do you want people to be able to host nodes behind Tor to participate in your consensus? And if you want that, you're not going to have that with sub-second latency, for example. Do you want, to have, do you want people to be able to host nodes uh, on a satellite connection? Do you want, are you OK with every node being hosted on a cloud? So those are 
I would say, almost political decisions at the level of the network, not technical decisions. So, you know, the, the barriers around latency have, they, they're not about technical excellency, they're not about having, you know, like uh, sometimes smarter consensus algorithms, they're really about this type of, um, of decisions. So you avoid the latency of hopping between different, uh, uh, different rollups, you integrate natively with other tools, and also potentially parallel execution of smart contracts. I think that one is, uh, is a bit more speculative because you get a lot of benefits without even attempting to do any uh, parallel execution of, uh, of smart contracts. Oh, that's another thing I'd like to mention. And sorry, this is going to get a little bit in the weeds. So parallel execution of, of, of contracts is one of the things that um, uh, Fuel VM is starting, uh, is starting, and, and, and so on. So some chains have, have had this idea of saying, look, we're going to do um, just some execution sharding where you have different contracts and then you know, every computer nowadays is multi-core, even a Raspberry, uh, a Raspberry Pi now I think has four cores. So you'd like to be able to use some parallelism. Now the cheapest thing you can do uh, on a blockchain for parallelization is just parallelize signatures. Like you can verify all the signatures because they don't interact with each other. You can do that in parallel very easily. Um, executing smart contracts in parallel can be a bit more difficult because they might interact with each other. So you'd like to know ahead of time that they're not going to interact with each other. So there's interesting um, computer science problems around it. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that if you go into the weeds on this, you will see that parallel execution interferes with mempool. Like the fact that transactions, when transactions are published on a network, they go into your mempool. Mem mempools have spam prevention mechanism. So spam prevention mechanism relies on gas cost, but those gas costs are dependent on whether or not your contract is going to be executed in parallel or not. Now, if you move to an L2, you don't have a mempool. Your mempool is the main chain. Why am I mentioning that? It's just another example of like, if you want to have parallel execution, all of a sudden you realize, wait a second, it's a lot easier to do parallel execution in an L2. Even if you had a single L2, even if you had a single rollup, it's easier to have parallel execution inside a single rollup than it would be on an L1 because of spam consideration in the mempool. There are tiny things like this, you know, this is very, I'm not expecting like naturally everyone to just jump into and dive into this problem. I just want to bring it up because it's, it's an example of all these little technical difficulties that you get with scaling and ones that kind of go away once you do an L2. So I really don't want people to, um, if, you know, if you come out of here with one idea, I would say it should be that L2 is not about fragmentation. It's not about having like every application is its own rollup. It's really about the smartest way to scale. Okay, so parallel execution of smart contracts, possibly that's an interesting one to have, but honestly, I think we can have really, really high throughput and, and a lot of benefits without getting there. And atomic synchronous call between contracts in different languages, right? It's not about having uh, a sort of like EVM type ledgers that lives next to a Mikkelsen type ledger and that weekly interact. No, no, it means like any contract in any language calling another contract in another language and all of this working together. So all of the, you know, really the deep and rich composabilities that, um, that you can have. In terms of runtime, right now we have WASM based uh, rollups. Um, if we want to support a lot of languages, we're exploring different options. One option is RISC-V, which is a good uh, target. Um, there's also interesting um, ZK projects around RISC-V, so that's one possibility to look at in, uh, in the future for this. So if we look even further down the line, what could it look like? Well, so one idea is a bit out there, but which I find very interesting, would be to simplify the L1. We could say, look, instead of having still you know, data and execution in the L1, you get rid of it. We just say, okay, L1 is just going to do consensus settlement. Uh, staking, and then of course participate in uh, that availability layer. That's it. You have a very, very minimal L1. And all of your smart contracts, well, you know, since you support them, uh, uh, since you support Mikkelsen here, you migrate. So you take the state of the L1, you migrate it into the L2, and you have an absolutely minimal L1. So what does that do for you? I mean, the first thing it does is that it's really neat and clean, but that's not a good reason to do it. Uh, the main reason to do it is because your L1 is so simple now, you can really crank um, down the latency. Because the less your validator has to do, if all your validator has to do is just basically check that consensus has happened, check that the hash of a commitment to the DAO was included, like really 
the least amount of compute you have to put on the bakers, the more they can do per second. And if you have lower latency, the latency that you have on L1 carries over to the UHD. So if you want really, really low latency, you remove all the barriers to consensus. You just put all of that into this execution layer and keep this as light as possible. So that would simplify uh, the L1, and you also lower uh, much lower latency. And that's, I think, if you want to have block times uh, below a second without having everyone in a data center, I think that's, uh, that's how you do it. Uh, that might not work well with uh, things like Tor, so there's a choice here. But as a trade-off, I think it's not, not, not so bad. Um, and it means that you know, we're scaling, and this is a world where you know, we scale to uh, millions and more of transactions per second, and Baker still can run on very, very light and very small uh, hardware. Well, that's an interesting design. This is a bit off um, in the future. I think the part to really remember is the idea of the UHD being this rollup that's focused really on uh, interrupt. So yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, there's a lot of uh, spec work that needs to be done, um, specifically around how to get all of these languages to interact. It's also um, an opportunity to um, start a little bit from scratch. Uh, with a lot of experience um, into how uh, a blockchain runs. So before committing to any decision, it's good to have a think. Um, what should be the binary format uh, between contracts talking to each other? What should be calling conventions? What do the RPCs look like? You know, um, you don't have opportunities to have a clean slate very often, and so you really want to make the most of it, which means spec work. Careful implementation. Now, the good news is that implementing uh, an L2 like this is a lot less work than implementing an L1. You might think like, oh wow, it's a whole new blockchain. You know, that, that, that sounds like a lot of work. And it is a lot of work, but it's not as much work as an L1. Because an L1 does a lot more than this. An L1 has a peer-to-peer -peer layer. An L1 has consensus. An L1 has staking. An L1 has a mempool. There's a lot. Here, you're talking about something that doesn't do uh, input and output, essentially. The input and output is handled for you by the L1 blockchain. So you really, it's much more of an execution engine that you're building. You know, still work. Don't think it is easy, but it's a lot less than, uh, than building an L1. In, in the order of how this thing is developed, I would say interoperability comes first because performance is something you can crank with optimization a lot of the time. Interoperability is more about uh, you know, spec design than I was mentioning. So I would say some of the priorities are uh, Programming smart contracts in top mainstream languages. And one, I think, good insight into this is if you look at the Electric Capital Report, they, they measure how many uh, programmers are active in different uh, uh, language, languages and different ecosystems. And they say, look, Ethereum is at the top. Uh, Solidity has won. Like, you know, oh, the EVM has won. And you look at it, and it's like 5,000 developers in the world are using, are using it. And it's, uh, it's 10 times more. I think Tezos is around 500. So it's 10 times more than Tezos. But it's also 4,500 more. It's like the absolute number is absolutely tiny. Like this is very, very small. So you know, to say that uh, Solidity is dominant in the blockchain ecosystem is 100% true. To say that it is one is, I think, a little ridiculous when you have languages which are used by many, many orders of magnitudes more people. So being able to leapfrog that, which doesn't mean not supporting Solidity, don't you know, like that's that's important. But you also want to be able to do things like Python and the JVM. Go, JavaScript, TypeScript, C++, .NET. If you have that, you have more than 50% developers in the world. Um, they are websites that count how many uh, repos are active on GitHub. And if you just go by that, it's just like a few of these languages actually give you this massive coverage. There are huge organizations who have very large code bases uh, in Java, for example, or in .NET. They are not rewriting this in Solidity. They want to have interoperability between their existing system and whatever they're going to be building. So there's a huge opportunity uh, for um, Acquiring usage in having this type of uh, support. Um, so, how does this work technically? Uh, so, not all of these, not all of these languages um, can be compiled. In fact, I would say most of them here cannot be compiled. Uh, so, for when they can be compiled, you compile them to some level, low-level assembly, execute that. When they are not, you include a uh, runtime binary uh, at the base layer of your rollup and have it execute uh, code. Exi uh, integrating blockchain into existing web applications should be as easy as importing uh, uh, a node library. Uh, I've mentioned atomic synchronous call between uh, languages. 
simple communication between smart contracts and app API for cross contact call, which is language specific. So that's some early design ideas for, uh, for, for, for how this works. But the idea really is, like, if you're a developer and you're used to a certain stack and you're used to a certain system, you should be able to come in, not have to learn a new language, not have to learn a new ecosystem, not have to new, learn a new library. It should just work for you. Uh, and then once we have really nailed down this uh, developer experience and um, this interoperability, go for the ultra high throughput. So the hardware requirements for the UHD node operators could be very high, but that's fine because we don't need to have thousands of people running this hardware. We need to have one honest person in the world. I mean, ideally we have 10 honest person, but all we need for security is one. So. You know, you could imagine, you could go crazy. You know, imagine a machine that has, uh, I don't know, uh, 16 CPUs, each of them with 64 cores and a terabyte of RAM. Uh, that's, you know, that's very, very beefy, but you're talking about $20,000. And so the question is like, if there's, are there enough people in the world who can have a, who are honest and who can have a $20,000 machine to validate these rollups? Probably. Um, parallel execution is possible. And performance, the idea would be to target um, 1 million uh, TPS on a single machine. It says here, uh, assuming high parallelization, but I don't mean parallel execution of transaction. I think you can do 1 million TPS on a single machine only by parallelizing signature verification. And um, we had some early experiments like this that, that showed that this was possible. Essentially, you get all your transactions, you take all the signatures, you put that onto separate CPUs, so you have all your CPUs, all your cores, verify all the signature, and then on a single core, you just do the, you know, like move one bit here, move one bit here, you stay in RAM. Like, if you just look at it as an IO update in RAM, a million TPS is actually not that much. So, yes, like I've mentioned, we're not redoing the hard parts of building a, uh, a blockchain. We already have very important and very complex parts, a consensus algorithm, a shell, a system for input outputs, data availability, that's coming soon. Uh, and a strong community and ecosystem. So that part, that's largely built. That is not something that needs to be built for this, uh, for this UHD. So, of course, you know, don't wait for the UHD. Keep building. Uh, the WASM rollups uh, remain supported and maintained. There's no breaking changes, so you know, this is not going to uh, change anything about uh, the compatibility on Tezos. There will be a migration offered between smart rollups and UHD if anyone uh, wants that. So, for example, let's say that you've deployed on the uh, EVM rollup, and then at some point you're thinking, like, oh, wow, maybe it would make sense to fold that into the UHD. Migration can be uh, offered. And so it's something that's going to be evolutive. It's not going to replace anything that's, uh, that exists. It's something that can come in and subsume uh, existing functionality and enhance it. And then look forward to not worrying about jumping between L1 and L2 or between different L2s. And the best of all world. So you get the security of uh, Mikkelsen as a, uh, you know, uh, in terms of language security, compatibility with Solidity, or the comfort of your mainstream language, whichever is, uh, is most appealing to you. Easy interop, and of course, um, very low latency and high throughput. So we can have it all with uh, UHC. That's the, uh, that's the general uh, uh, philosophy. So, if you look at uh, the edge of uh, Tezos today, really it's, uh, it's been rapid evolution. It's um, this ability to adapt quickly, um, notice important trends, uh, and implement and, uh, and, and be ready. So that comes from the strong governance system and the culture of uh, upgradability. So ship and upgrade progressively. Again, evolution, not revolution. A streamlined governance process, uh, uh, solid implementation, and also teams with a, a really strong uh, experience for building um, Tezos and smart rollups. All right, I think that's it. I'm going to take some questions. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so the data availability layer, um, it's run by, it's part of L1. It's really run by, it's not a separate thing. It's run by every single uh, baker. So 
what it does essentially is it spreads the download, it spreads the load across bakers as opposed to having every single baker download everything. Okay. And uh, the UHT rollup, uh, yeah. Why did you yeah, so there's a, an interesting question with rollups is uh, how do we incentivize people to run rollups? Um, and there's two approaches to that. Uh, you can't, Sorry. you know, you can either have an open set and you can say like, look, anyone can be a rollup validator. Now that's very appealing because if anyone can be a rollup validator, then you're opening the set of people who can come in and do challenges and do all sorts of things. So that's, that's good. But if anyone can be a rollup validator, uh, then you can't just reward people for doing that because it, you, need, you could have an infinite no number of people running rollup validators. Uh, or you could have a more permission set of uh, rollup validators. You could say, well, there's a token, and if you stake the token, you have to validate the rollups and do these things, and then, then you can be rewarded, but now you have a smaller set. So incentivization of running a rollup nodes can be hard. Another approach is no incentive. We essentially say, nope, there's just zero incentive. So why would anyone do it? And the answer is because it's cheap on the grand scheme of things. And so, yeah, if you have a, a rollup and there's absolutely nothing on it, then maybe no one is going to bother. But if you have a rollup and there's a lot of economic activity on, uh, that, that's happening on it, there's enough actors who have enough of a personal incentive to just do it. Like even if there's a bit of a free rider problem, if the absolute cost is small enough, some people will do it in practice. And so currently that's the approach that's, uh, that's been taken. There's just no incentive. The idea being like if you are a successful dApps uh, on Tezos and you have all these users and you're running all these servers anyway, it's marginal cost to you to run an extra rollup validator. You get some uh, marketing out of it by saying like, hey, we are actually a proud validator of the rollup and that's just like, that just pays for it. So that's the, uh, that's the current approach. You have hybrid approach where you could, uh, where you could say, look, we have a, uh, we have a, maybe there's a, maybe everyone can run it, but if you want to be rewarded, you have to stake a token. Like you can, you can imagine these hybrid approaches. It doesn't, those hybrid approaches don't work if you want to have many, many rollups because you can't just go out and incentivize out of the protocol just every single rollup. For something like ZUHT, it's something that could be deployed. I think you could go and say like, look, if somehow there's a lack of people willing to validate the node, you could imagine uh, like, a round robin or randomly selecting uh, some uh, some some stickers to do it. But honestly, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's necessary. We see uh, enough services that are provided just uh, for clout uh, in the ecosystem that I that that I actually don't foresee this as a problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of work going into minimizing. The trust required for a light client, you know, so you can have something running on your phone that is validating that the, the data you're seeing is, is right. Um, and with, with DAL, we're going to have, uh, you know, very trust minimized data availability for like your mobile phone, and that's going to be cool. But um, as we like scale the execution layer, like a phone's not, uh, you know, how, how are we going to, um, like, can you just talk about our thoughts on, uh, uh, trusting the execution layer, like of the node that you're talking to. Yeah. So here's how here's how the trust assumption change essentially. When you have an L1 and you run a node that's just you know following the chain, your trust assumptions are are very minimal. You're just you know seeing the chain and you can validate that it's that all the data is there because you're downloading the data. Um, and you can also validate that all the execution was correct, every signature was correct. So you're going to do all this. Uh, it doesn't mean that they can't be reorganizations. Uh, of course, you know, there could be double spends if uh, the miners collude or uh, the block producers collude. Um, you could have situations where um, you also have like stalls, maybe liveness is attacked, but at least you know, you're certain about the integrity of the ledger. If you move to a world where you have uh, a separate execution layer that run inside an optimistic rollup, then those assumption changes. Because it means either you are validating the rollup yourself, right, which requires a lot of compute, or you are trusting the fact that if there was at any point in time an invalid transition inside a rollup, someone would have noticed and someone would have called it out. So you're not verifying for yourself, you're relying on incentives and game theory 
in order to convince yourself about the integrity of the ledger. If you use a zero knowledge a validity rollup, for example, zk rollup instead, then you have cryptographic proof and then you're back at the first uh, assumption. So if you want to preserve exactly the trust assumption that you would have by having um, like some light hardware that's validated the chain, then you would want to have a zk rollup. I think in terms of like the market demand, you're far better off having an optimistic rollup because the cost of generating proofs for ZK rollup is extremely high. It's gone down, but I don't think it's going to go down by orders of magnitude. And it would have to go, at least not in the short term, and for it to be competitive with optimistic rollup, it would have to go down by orders of magnitude. Um, especially if we want to focus on things like interop. So the best way to have this type of interoperability is essentially to have a very low level virtual machine, very low level assembly type virtual machine, and then you compile on top of it. So the benefit of doing that is that it's easy, you can get all these languages, you know, you compile whether you compile the language or an interpreter for the language. You have this virtualization, you have this overhead, but because it's an optimistic rollup, you don't really care about the overhead. Maybe your rollup validator doesn't even run with the overhead, maybe they run native code directly, or maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's a cost of like two or three, so you're fine. When you're doing, and, and you know, if you look at the design of Mikkelsen, for example, Mikkelsen was really designed with the idea of saying, you know, like execution is expensive on a blockchain, everything that's a premium, we want to have as little uh, overhead as possible in terms of counting gas, and that's why you have this kind of like high level, low level VM in Mikkelsen. With an optimistic rollup, you separate the concern, it's no longer the validator's job, and so you might as well have an assembly level. You're doing ZK, you're gonna have overheads in, you know, like, factors of, of thousands or tens of thousands. Um, and you can parallelize, but it's still extremely costly. And so if you do EVM and on top of that, you're gonna have like, so if you do a, a ZK VM, but your ZK VM is low level, you're really in a, in a world of trouble. And I'm very, very surprised by how much people are trying to make a ZK VM a thing, because you're really starting at a big disadvantage when you're trying to do that, as opposed to trying to have at least a language that both a good compilation target and both something that can be easily proven in, uh, in ZK. I mean, trying to have compatibility with hash functions inside of like ZVM that were never meant to really be implemented inside of a, uh, of a ZK circuit, just because there's 5,000 CD developers in the world sounds just sadistic, to be honest. Uh, now, I think in the f maybe, you know, it, it's good to keep an eye open. Uh, I've mentioned, you know, for example, Risk Zero, which is doing uh, stock proofs on, uh, on, on, on Risk Five uh, instruction set. That definitely is something to keep an eye on. Like you want to be looking at this because it, it could improve, or it could be that the demand for throughputs are low enough that actually the cost doesn't matter all that much. But I would say the sweet spot right now is when, uh, is with an optimistic rollup. So, so just to summarize, then uh, pick a rollup node that you trust won't equivocate, like, you know, uh, by sending you some bad state, right? Like the state of the ledger, you know. Oh no, no. So the state of the ledger you can um, you get by following the chain. You can get a, you get it by following the chain. What you have to trust is that at no point did an invalid transition in a rollup happened, because it would have been called. Right. But you but, but you know if if you yeah, once you make this assumption, you don't have right. to trust anyone about the state. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Yes. Uh, the biggest concern I hear from developers in choosing an ecosystem uh, has been the relative lack of tooling on Tezos. Uh, I remember you said in the Q3 Masari call that uh, 2023 would be a year of uh, growth in tooling. Yeah. Uh, could you speak more to that and, and what developers can look forward to? Yeah, so you know, I think that, that first of all, the, the tooling in Tezos has come a very long way. Um, it, it used to be really, uh, really sparse. Um, I would say it, it's now a strength of the of the Tezos ecosystem. But the tooling goes beyond, I would say, a lot of uh, developer tools. You know, if you talk to a lot of Solidity developers or developers in the Ethereum ecosystem, they'll mention things like Open Zeppelin, so libraries of smart contract being able, uh, available. It's it's not just the, the direct tool chain; it's also the ecosystem that comes uh, around it. And there's been some libraries, and I would say. Today, I would, uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, probably the most useful work today is actually exposing what already exists and making it visible to developers and integrating it into uh, a, sim a, sim a single developer portal as opposed to necessarily like building anything new. But the huge benefit, I would say, of, uh, of, of this approach of going to mainstream languages is not having to maintain tooling. Because the Tezos ecosystem exists as a, 
as it has its own ecosystem, it has its own languages, it has its own tools. It's a lot to maintain. And all of a sudden, if you're saying like, look, now if you want to have smart contracts on Tezos, you can write them in, uh, in JavaScript or you can write them in Python. Well, you don't have to build an IDE for that. You don't have to build a, uh, a tool chain for that. You don't have to build libraries for that. It all exists. It's all out there. You don't have to maintain this. So probably the best thing to do in terms of like bringing better tools for developers is to piggyback on existing tool chains of, of, of very, very popular languages. You know, languages not used by 5,000 people, but used by hundreds of millions of people. Um, so that's the approach. But you know, in the more immediate term, I would say it's surfacing all the tools that, uh, that, that exist. You know, there's libraries of smart contracts, for example, that have been made available that I think many people don't know about and uh, making it visible. So it's really uh, around documentation and, uh, and communication. Okay, thank you very much.